Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online as we get set for K-State in Texas this weekend. A major matchup in what is probably the biggest weekend of the year for the Big 12. They have five teams that are tied at the top of the league standings at 4-1. and one. Five of them, well, four of them play each other, and the fifth one is playing a team that is just a game behind and just beat one of the top teams in KU last week. So it is a wild, wild weekend uh, in the Big 12, and I guess we'll, we'll talk about it in greater length later on in the show, but I might as well start by showing everybody the way the schedule looks like this week. K-State and Texas get it started at 11 a.m. We all know that on Fox this weekend. Big noon kickoff for the Cats and the Horns. And then Oklahoma and Oklahoma State at 2.30 on ABC. Houston and Baylor, who cares about them? UCF and Cincinnati, who cares about them? But 6 o'clock, you get KU and Iowa State. That will be a significant one uh, to keep an eye on. So big games all abound. Three different networks, three marquee time slots. It's uh, it, just in general, it is a big weekend for the Big 12, not just for how the league standings will play out, but in terms of the visibility that they are going to get this weekend. And if you're watching this, you, TCU and Texas Tech have probably already played. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, when you're seeing this, unless you're just so so locked into the KSO show that you're watching Thursday night over actual live football games, uh, you probably already know what happened in Texas Tech and TCU, um, which... Well, who knows? We'll see how that ends up playing out. You want to pretend be... you play the pretend game where we act like we know what happened? Uh, this has gotten me into some trouble in the past, uh, as I think we know. I nailed it. I think I nailed it the one I time think I did. So. It. Um, it was the Hail Mary game, West Virginia Houston. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. I. I also. Yeah. I've done it in a in a lot of games. Uh. I think I'll take the I'll take the home team. I think uh, back in the NCAA tournament, I was doing a podcast after K-State beat Michigan State, and the whole time I was just like, yeah, I'm talking like Tennessee won the game. Uh, and Tennessee did not win the game, and it did not work out uh, well in the Cats' favor moving forward. So that unfortunate, but that's how it goes. So I'm not going to talk like it, ha it goes down anyway. Um, I, I think that it, it will be – it's probably a fascinating game. Have it, it already happened, so. Guns up. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I they probably have a little bit more fight to them than TCU, but I don't even know at this point. If Jake Strong is throwing it to the other team, they might just bail early. Some of the guys might walk away. Uh, but, you know, who cares about a random Thursday night game between two teams that may not even end up in bowl games this year in the Big 12? Um, that's certainly a possibility because we've got a massive one on deck for the Cats and the Horns. Big noon kickoff this weekend. It is going to be an exciting time to see uh, what K-State can do and try and put themselves back into kind of the driver's seat to be a team in Arlington. It's wild to look at it right now and just say, man, if you didn't play the worst game in a long time at K-State against Oklahoma State, you're 5-0 and in the Big 12, you're 7-1, and and instead of being, you know, they're 25 in the AP, they're 23 in the college football playoff pool, they're probably still inside the top 15. They're, they are way up there in this. Instead, it feels like maybe some missed opportunities, but you still have a chance and you can go and, and kind of eradicate all of your past pains of the season if you're able to take down Texas this week. I, I see that the KSO show observes the AP rankings. Well, we're uh, no, actually what it is, is I forgot to uh, to change that from uh, when we did the show on Monday and the CFP hadn't come out yet. So uh, yeah, well, and just we're proper journalists, D.Y., so we're going to respect. Hey, I, I laughed. I saw uh, one of the TV stations down here in, in Wichita posted some story about all the games this weekend, and they were using the AP rankings, which I thought was funny. It's like, okay, they're sticking with their boys. That's uh, that good, good for them. But, no, if it was up to me, we, the college football playoff one would be in there, which yeah. I say that it is up to me. I make the graphics, so I quite literally could decide, but – uh, I was I, I forgot about it and we're using the one for Monday. So uh, I'm, I'm actually yeah. anti anti journalist. So I'm giving okay, it a yeah, uh, that's a brave stance yeah. of you in 2023. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, big game, right? Uh, big 12 title implications. You get a great triple header in the Big 12. That'll be a lot of fun to watch for the common fan for us. Um, well, for you because you you won't be at the, in Austin, so you'll get to check out all three probably pretty well. For me, I'll be, probably be kind of neck deep in the 
post game coverage and I'll, I'll likely miss Bedlam for the most part. Maybe catch the second half. It's going to be a great weekend. Um, maybe not great about halfway through this game when Patrick Gongba likely picks Duke, but uh, hopefully the second half goes well and if everyone forgets about it for Kansas State. But uh, I'm trying to think, you know, trying to think of a bigger game. I guess, heck, it's the same situation as it was last last year. The game just played in a different spot because Kansas State was 4-1 in the Big 12 when they played Texas at home last season. The, the Longhorns just weren't as competitive at that point. Yeah, no, it's it, look, it's going to be interesting, I think, to, to see how this game goes down. And for K-State facing Texas, this is this is a major opportunity for them to go out there and and kind of get things back on on the right track. I mean, they've, they've been playing well the last three weeks. But if you lose to Texas, those really didn't mean anything. You just beat bad teams. And we know that the Big 12 has a lot of bad teams this year. But yeah, I, I you, the momentum say. has been built up to where this feels like a game where K-State has a legitimate shot going down there. And in some people's eyes, maybe they should win, given the fact that Texas is on their backup quarterback. Yeah, I was going to say, this is a game where you try to validate what you've done the last two or three weeks. Yeah. I mean, then there there are a lot of games like that in the Big 12 this weekend to keep an eye on. Uh, a lot of teams that are going to have the opportunity to maybe back up what they have uh, gone ahead and done. So we'll have to monitor the situation and see where things go from here. But, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how K-State kind of responds and, and answers everything. All right, so let's just kind of start to dive in and, and break this break down this game. What – Going into it is something that you think K-State is actually going to be able to do well against Texas. I mean, I think the thing that a lot of people have talked about is the quarterback run game because that's something that historically Texas has not been very good at stopping. And then obviously K-State has two guys that are very capable of running at that position. Is that one of the things that you're confident in K-State doing or is there something else that sticks out that you think K-State might get able might be able to get to work against Texas? You wonder, right? Uh, because the, regardless of who the opponent is, in my opinion, what we've kind of learned about Kansas State this year is that to throw the ball, they have to be able to run the ball. That's just something that we've kind of seen. I don't think that this team can adequately throw the ball enough to win without a good running game. Uh, I just don't know that'll work against Texas. They've stopped the run fairly, fairly well for the most part. Um, I think 3.1 yards per carry. Um, so it's going to be up to that, but you have an All-American in Cooper BB. They have a really good interior defensive line. They're Without that, I'll just say this. I don't know if that's going to work, but without that, Kansas State's in trouble. Well, I don't like you. Just, I, we're only 10 minutes into this. You didn't have to start throwing around lines I, I like K-State's did. in trouble, even if it's a hypothetical. I, well, I could barely get the words out of my mouth because I'm so sick. As people could probably like, why does he act like he's gasping for air as if he's drowning every time he speaks? Might That's be. why I'm losing my voice. But um, th- I was doing the calculation. This is my 18th show this week. So <laughs> that's a lot. Might also, We're working you might, too hard. Might have been working my vocal cords a little too much, a little overwork. Um, I was trying to get tips from Wyatt Thompson earlier, but he didn't <laughs> have any adv- advice for me. No, I, look. I don't think the Kansas State plan has to change from week to week this year based on who the opponent is just because of how they are equipped as an offense. They're a little bit limited because they don't have the dynamic receiver that can really, you know, carry the bell right now. So they have to kind of bandage this thing together and it doesn't work without a good running game. Yeah, no, I mean, they have to run the ball. I think really against any team, they're going to have to be able to run the ball the rest of the year. It's not just the Texas thing, but Texas is the type of team and has the talent to where it's much easier to assume that they could take it away from K-State. And and that's the one thing is the Wildcats are going to have to come in prepared in some way to be able to open this thing up, even if it is shut down initially. Because, yeah, you, yeah. they're not going to beat Texas if Will Howard has to throw the ball 30 times. I mean, yeah. even, I think even 30 times is like it, you're probably right. This is one of those games where Texas knows what you're going to do and you got to be able to do it anyway. Yeah. I mean, l- the last three weeks, I mean, K State has not been throwing the ball that much. And again, they, they've been able to beat these teams and they've won yes, these sir. games. But against Tech, the, the, the final tally was 18 pass attempts, 
TCU, K-State threw the ball 26 times. And then against Houston, K-State put the ball in the air 24 times. So it's not like the Wildcats are throwing a ton even in those games. And you're doing that to, to dominate teams that are inferior to you. And while it's easier to just run, run, run consistently, it also would have been easy for K-State in those games to say, okay, let's try and open it up a little bit more, hit some big plays with, with going to the air. And they didn't just because what you do to be successful – against bad teams, you also want to do to be successful against good teams and keep yourself in it. And that's just kind of who K-State is this year. Plus, we know that in addition to the running quarterback situation, they've got some good running backs that can get the job done. So um, we'll, we'll have to monitor and see how that you're, plays you're out. You're right that the number of pass attempts will probably tell us how the game went. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. There you go. D.Y. is smiling because he saw that I just changed it to – I changed it to the college football playoff rankings because we've got – anti-journalist it was, Derek it was, Young. It was bothering you too, though, I could tell. Oh, no, I was definitely upset at myself when I realized that I, 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 because I even, I, you know, in the weed stuff, I even saved like files the way that I needed to, to go back in and edit them after the fact. And I just, I didn't, because I was an idiot. So, well, at least we didn't go with the coaches poll because there would be no number. No, the coaches, the coaches are dead to me and have been for a long time. So if you ever reference the coaches poll, I just assume that you're either an idiot or you're for some reason like best friends with one of the coaches. I don't know. I the coaches the pull. Is pull. Yeah, the SIDs pull. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you know, you, we talk about what K State maybe can do in, in this game, what they'll need to do successfully. It sounds like conversely, even though they need to run the ball well in this game, you're maybe a little weary that they're going to be able to do it against Texas, who has one of the stouter run defenses that K-State will face this year. Yeah, but I definitely don't think they'll be – like, I guess my answer is not really changing all much. Mm -hmm. Like, they, they might be able to do it. I don't know. I'm 50-50 on that because it's kind of strength against strength. But can they throw it? Not without the running game. So they might be able to throw it if they can run it. Like, yeah, we can't, this Kansas State's offense is the same every game. Like, yeah. I think we know exactly – what the formula has to be, and it doesn't matter. It's not going to change whether it's versus TCU, whether it's versus Bueller, whether it's versus Texas. It's the same. Hey, look, I would love to see the Cats face Bueller and see how that that worked out. Um, I mean, one of the things in this game that I think is is important as we we move on here and take a look at what uh, might concern you is obviously the talent that Texas has in a lot of different areas of the field is concerning, especially, you know, given some of the struggles that K-State has had. And probably it's a lesson because it's Malik Murphy at quarterback and not Quinn Ewers, but the receivers obviously have an evident advantage over K-State's corners, which have played better over the last couple of weeks. But it's not like they, they've had these dominant performances this year and been tested by the, you know, the, the stoutest of competition because even Houston this past weekend was without one of their top receivers. So um, they kind of caught a break there and then they faced backup quarterbacks against tech and TCU. Texas is going to have Adonai Mitchell. They're going to have Xavier worthy. They can make plays. And if Malik Murphy can get the ball to him, then that puts Texas in a really good spot. But in addition to that, Texas's offense is really predicated on Jonathan Brooks busting off some big runs I mean, K-State's already faced five of the top 15 rushers this season. They've done a pretty good job of holding those guys below their average um, as like a cumulative look at them. But Jonathan Brooks, you can stop the guy on 17 of his 20 run attempts and think you're doing a great job. But the way he kind of makes his hay and how the Texas run game has worked this year is he's going to pop you for a couple of 25, 30, 35-yard runs that are backbreakers, and that's ultimately what K-State has to try and stop this weekend, and and that's probably the area defensively that concerns me the most because I actually do think that the way the secondary is playing, especially with the safeties factored in, that they might actually be able to take advantage a little bit of a guy like Malik Murphy, uh, who's really playing his first legit competition level at, at the college game. I mean, he, he placed BYU last week, but BYU is not K-State, and we, we've seen in the past, like, I think about Spencer Rattler's first game at Oklahoma. He didn't really play anybody that was a challenge to him that first week. I think they played, like, Missouri State. 
And then K-State went down there and beat him and made him make some errors. I think this K-State secondary can actually force some errors from Malik Murphy. It's going to come down to how you stop the run game. And even though K-State has done it at a pretty good level, um, they've been known to give up their big play and that backbreaker. And Jonathan Brooks and Texas do it better than anybody else in the league. Yeah, I mean, Texas has good rushing numbers, but like you said, it's really predicated on just being explosive because from a down-to-down basis, they haven't been as impressive, really. Um, well, very heavily swayed towards the explosives. Passing game, I agree. We are talking about a guy making his second career start as a redshirt freshman against the defense that is number three in the red zone and I think number seven on third down. So... Texas is going to want to run the ball to set up things for Murphy, too. They're not going to want to put the game on him. Um, second, second career start, redshirt freshman, one of the best red zone defenses in the country, one of the best third down defenses in the country. Um, to be honest, the formula for both teams is the same. That's why I said, you know, I don't know. I forget what my best bet <laughs> is, but a good bet. And this might be what my best bet for the game is, is probably the under. Um, just because both teams are going to want to run the ball yeah. to set up the pass. Texas is going to do it to protect Murphy. Can't say has to do it. Um, because that is the, the way that they're kind of built as an offense for this year. And when you run the ball a lot, one, longer drives, more time, fewer possessions. And both of these teams can stop, can stop the run too. So we're re- we're really headed for a low scoring affair. Well, and and I you know I, you talk about okay these two teams are probably going to try and do a lot of things similarly. I mean they that's kind of what their strengths are. If that's the case, I mean if they, and then go blow for blow in the areas that they are similar in, it's probably going to come down to even though we're expecting minimal reliance or at least you would probably hope on both sides minimal reliance on the quarterback play it's probably going to come down to which quarterback steps up in the few moments that you need him to. And, I mean, K-State, it's crazy to say, but they do have the leg up here in the fact that Will Howard has stepped up in those moments before. He did it last year, and he has all that experience. Malik Murphy does not. You would maybe give K-State a little bit of the edge there, and I think that's probably why you know some people would maybe think that K-State wins this game. Uh, I, I think that's probably ultimately, even though we don't think the quarterbacks are going to play a huge role in this, at least in terms of you know throwing the for 300 yards and putting it in the air 35 times, they are going to ultimately be the ones that decide the outcome based on how they play when they are needed. And I think, I, I think the way Will Howard has been playing, he will be up for the challenge and he will actually be able to give K-State the opportunity to win the game in Austin. Yeah, which, which quarterback loses the game? That, that could be also what happens. Yeah, I mean, that that seems like the most likely scenario to discuss and think about. All right, so we've talked about offense, defense, everything else in this game that might be of concern. Um, one of the things that, that K-State has dealt with you know, throughout the, the entirety of this season is some guys being banged up and having to rotate everything else defensively, especially at like linebacker. You're gonna. How important is it for K State to have guys? I, I, I not healthy, but because you're not going to have guys healthy. But with the fact that you've got like Jake Clifton and Austin Romaine, dudes that are still pretty green behind the ears. I mean, how much of a struggle is that for them against a team like Texas versus? you know, when they've played like TCU or somebody else this season? Yeah, I don't know that health is really going to play into it. I think they, they're they back close to or at 100%. Same with Ben Sinnott at tight end. When we're talking about the inexperience or the youth in general, I think it's just, you know, maybe that initial shock to the system. Um, watching the tape, watching the film doesn't do it justice. Texas is the biggest, fastest, strongest team you play every year when you're Kansas State. You don't play against athletes for anyone else, even Oklahoma, that really mirror what Texas has on the field. It, it can be startling at first. So there there could be an adjustment period there to it's like, okay, this is what it is. This is what it's like. And even this week, you, you hear some things from Chris Kleiman, Joe Klanerman, Will Howard. Um, I've even ratcheted up those compliments, that praise, and sort of addressed 
that not mismatch, but you know, big attribute that Texas always has when it comes to those freaky, athletic, big, strong guys that are hard to move, or you know, the speed on the field. And they said even more than in years past, Texas has more of that. They're even better this year in that regard in terms of the athletes they have. So it's that adjustment period for the, the players that haven't seen Texas type athletes before. Yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll see. I just that that's one of those areas that, that those guys have played well this year, but um, inexperience on defense. Even as guys have started to play better, no matter the level, it's a brand new ball game for what they're about to face in terms of what Texas has. And honestly, Mizzou is probably the best comparison in terms of talent on the field um, to what Texas will bring. And, uh, you know, K State, for the most part in that game, I thought actually did a pretty good job against Mizzou. They just had the explosives. And part of that got corrected, I think, because, you know, that the safeties have been aligned in a different way now. And that was one of those where Marky Siegel and I think VJ Payne had some pretty big misconnects in that game. The communication was poor. And then Kobe Savage was not at 100% yet. Like, I don't care what anybody says. He just wasn't ready. The last three, four weeks, Kobe Savage has looked much more like the Kobe Savage of 2022 when he was healthy. That's a good sign. The other safeties are playing well now that they're in a different position. And the corners are gaining more confidence. And obviously, the game that Will Lee had last week was a big deal. So I think you have to take a little bit from your experiences against Mizzou and try and translate into this game. And, you know, for the most part, there are some good things there. And I I think if you if you gave everybody the option right now, you said, okay, you can either play it straight up, you don't know what happens, or you can say right now, K-State and Texas, that game plays out pretty similar to the Missouri game, and K-State has a chance to right their wrongs with the football up by like a field goal or four points, whatever it was, with eight minutes left in the game, can they go down and extend that to, to two scores or at least get, uh, you know, it to a touchdown lead. And I think you would take that if you're a K yeah. stater right now, because I, I think, I mean, Texas is probably better than Missouri, but honestly, given the circumstance at quarterback right now for Texas and everything else, I, it's really not that big of a difference between the two sides. I mean, both Texas and Missouri have top 15 rushers in the country right now this year. And you've got, obviously, the receiver talent was there at Missouri with Luther Burden. Um, now, you kind of double it a little bit or add a half point to it for Texas because uh, even though there are you know, some good second and third options for Mizzou, the, the one-two punch isn't the same as what Texas has. But I, I think that this is – that your comp for this game would be what you saw against Missouri for this defense. And I thought they played actually fairly well in that game. They just were, they had the game put in their hands too many times and the dam finally burst. I think they've gotten better since then. And I think that the offense is in a better place now against Texas. And I think that's why, I mean, I, I do actually think this ends up being a close game for K-State and Texas. Yeah, low scoring. And uh, you'd hope that the defense is kind of, the strides that they've made and the experience that they had in that Missouri game helped them for this one. All right, last thing we got to do before we dive into best bets. Uh, it's K-State football in the year 2023. That means we got to talk about Avery Johnson. So where where do we expect the usage level of Avery Johnson at in this game? Um, just like the last three weeks, I think, I think you give them both a, a drive or two to begin the game and let the flow dictate it from there. I really do because – at this point, they went three for three in terms of how to do this. So, uh, don't quit a good thing. Okay, uh, I I agree with you to some extent. The one thing that I would add on to it is that I would be open uh, with seeing more Avery Johnson when you get to like the 15, 10 yard line of Texas. If you're in that position, I, honestly, if you just get into the red zone in general. Um, and you have, you know, the you have a, a yardage situation you like. So either first and ten, or on second or third down, you have a very manageable distance. I don't don't feel so committed to just letting Will Howard have a drive and do everything because that's where the legs of Avery Johnson can really step up. And also, we've seen him be able to put the ball in the air more the last two weeks when he has played. He's done a good job of doing it. 
He did a nice job on the on the you know it was a short throw, but he went through everything and did it right on the touchdown. He threw to Seth Porter. He threw some good balls to Jace Brown the week prior against TCU. He can throw it now, and you can trust him to throw it in a college game if you're K State. So I would just I don't know that we will see it, but I think that it, it would be nice to see an elevated usage for Avery Johnson when you get down there closer to the to the red zone because that was maybe the one thing we didn't see against Missouri. We saw it early in the game and on the first drive. And then after that, he only really got used that little stretch there in like late third, early fourth quarter. And it, they just, it was kind of odd how they, they went about it. Um, but I would just elevate how much you're using him in those situations and, and make a swap every once in a while. I mean, you don't have to just hand the drive over to him once you get down there, but he deserves a play or two every once in a while, because I think that makes K-State a better football team and more potent offensively in those situations. Yeah, I mean, they'll find out, you know, at some point whether what they need and, and and the game will call for Will Howard, you go with him. A game calls for Avery Johnson, you go with him. It's like a bullpen situation the way they've been doing this. Honestly, it is. Okay, well, then let's uh, real quick paint this hypothetical. If the K-State offense is struggling and things aren't going great, at what, what stage – do you recognize and say if you're you're Chris Kleiman or really Colin Klein because Chris Kleiman seems like he's deferred a lot of the quarterback decision making to Colin Klein? Uh, how far into this game do you go before you say, okay, we got to pull the plug, break glass in case of emergency? We're giving this game to Avery. He's he's got to save us now and get this offense going. I I think it's like just the way it, like if it's Texas Tech and it's it, like he's the one scoring, like it's. I know it sounds crazy. It's just whatever is working. Like it, if Avery is not working, I don't want it to just go with Avery just yeah. for the sake of it. So, like I said, they'll, they'll have a good idea in the first quarter. Like if this game's like, man, Texas can't stop a freaking QB run, then go Avery. But it, it really will depend. Like the Texas Tech game, Howard sputtered. You know, the Houston game, Avery threw that turnover and Howard was cooking. So, I mean, yep. I would just base it off their success levels. Well, we'll see uh, how it goes down. I mean, I, I I think, hey, look, Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein might not know when time is, but we know for a fact that everybody at K-State Online will know when the time is, right? They'll be sure to, to make that clear. Uh, so, we'll, we'll look forward to that. All right, time to move on. Best bets time. Here is a look at how last week's played out. Uh, tough Going week back to the DJ Giddens. Oh, uh, oh, no. oh, that worked, didn't it? Yeah, it was last week. Yeah, yeah, that was this was last week's. Uh, it was a, a, a tough go for uh, DY 0 and 3 the week that he had. Um, I was on, I was on fire. That was bound to happen. Yeah, I came up just short. Washington put up 42 on Stanford. I also hate myself because I said the over in general might be the call in that game. I think it was like 60 and a half. The, the total ended up being like 75, so that would have been the way to go. And then BYU, they tried. They had a couple of uh, like goal line stands, but it wasn't enough. They got beat. So I at least saving grace was DJ Giddens, but uh, kind of a surprising week for us. A combined one and five. Not good. Not good. I hope I hope everybody realized that these are for entertainment purposes only. All right. Well, uh, th this week it's for real, though. Here are the, here are the picks for this week. Uh, I told D.Y. before the show started that I have some real nasty picks this week. I've got Nebraska minus three against Michigan State. I have the under in Illinois and Minnesota of 43 and a half. And I, have, football. and I have Will Howard over 23 and a half rushing yards against Texas. So I know he, he'll probably trip over the white line a few times, but he will go past 23 and a half. I feel good about saying that. Uh, real quick, let me give it to you on the why of these picks. Number one, I almost just took Minnesota minus one and a half at home, um, which is still something that people should maybe consider because Illinois is just it's not not going very well for the the line I right now. They I thought they had a chance to kind of turn things around after they got that surprising win over Maryland. They really did nothing with it, so that's disappointing. And then these two, it's a Big Ten football. It's bad offenses. Uh, the, 44 points in this game, that seems like a pipe dream to reach. So I don't expect it. 
As for why I'm going with Nebraska, um, well, I've already been good at betting against Michigan State this season. Nebraska's kind of grooving right now. Some people might be astonished to find out that they are five and three, and they could they could win a game and be bull eligible for the first time in a while at Nebraska. And I think they do it by leaving little doubt against Michigan State. And in the Big Ten, little doubt is like winning by a full touchdown. Uh, so I think they do that, and I'm taking the Huskers minus three. Well, they could still win the Big Ten West. I think anybody can win the Big Ten West. If, if you if you went and picked up a team of fourth graders tomorrow, you could still win the Big Ten West. Okay. I like that. Uh, I like the Will Howard one a lot. Um, I went – I'll start with my kids. They went – Ben Sennett, over 29 and a half receiving yards. That's not a lot for a dude that's went over that plenty of times. I think if you're with the formula you have, if you are going to throw the ball, I think Sennett is going to get that number. I think it's probably a little lower just because he hasn't played a bunch in the last couple weeks or been at least emphasized in the passing game. I think that's a really probably easy number. I would be, he might double that. Like, yeah, it's one of those, one of those kinds of games for Kansas State, in my opinion. Look, I have USC plus three. If if you like him plus three, yeah, never mind. Yeah, USC plus three is probably safer. I think USC could win that game outright against Washington. We, we had to get our Washington bet yeah. in. So USC plus three. Look, they haven't really played to their capability all year. I'm thinking when you're playing one of the best teams in the country, that could draw that out of them. So I'll go USC. They finally play up to their potential. They probably won't next week, but I think they can this week. And then bed, Bedlam, excuse me. Oklahoma, they've really been struggling offensively, but they have a, have a good defense. Oklahoma State probably needs to make that a low possession game to win it. They have a really good running game, which is kind of conducive to the under as well. Like I, out of the three bets, I think I like that one even the most. Bedlam under 60 and a half, because I think you have – Two offenses that are solid but not really prolific, but you got two defenses that have been kind of figuring it out. Especially Oklahoma's defense can really stop stop a team as well. Um, low possession game. I just don't think there are enough possessions to get o- over the, the sixty and a half number. Man, <laughs> yeah, I, got, I got through it. Well, yeah, we'll give you a break here. Uh, look, a cu- couple of quick things on Will Howard and the rushing numbers. In the two games that he has played against Texas in his career, he's run for 79 and 83 yards in those games. Now, he's not as big of an emphasis in use in the rushing game, but he is still, while he's been out there, been used in ways that he can get you off maybe an easy 10-yard run occasionally and just a cumulative, uh, I think, will add up there for, for Howard with the rushing totals. Uh, also, real quick, D.Y., do you know the last time Nebraska played in a bowl game? Can you name the year? 2015. Close. 2016 was the last year they played in a bowl game. So, for those that, and thank you if you have, that have followed my coverage of Kansas State Wildcat football and basketball, in the time span that I have covered Kansas State, Nebraska has not reached a bowl. Yeah, that's uh, that is a that so is a it probably feels like point. I've been here a while at this point, and some of you are probably sick and tired of me at this point. But in that yeah. time span, Nebraska has not made a bowl game. I mean, 2017 feels like a long time, but the 2017 to now, September 1st, 2017 was my first day at Queso. Well, then that was the start of Mike Riley's final season as the head coach of Nebraska. Uh, Man, Scott Frost, we, we're not going to be able to really fully look at and see how much of a gift uh, it was for him to have that job for five years and fail miserably. So I I want to thank him and everybody else uh, up there in Lincoln for for what they gave us. And Matt Rule, I, you know, I'm not convinced that it's going to be what Nebraska people want it to be, but he's at least better and competent enough than Scott Frost was. So. Uh, that's that's again why I think that Nebraska this is this is such a big deal in game to them this weekend and I do think that if there's one thing that Matt Rule is good at it's probably getting these guys fired up to play in that game so uh, Nebraska minus three I know it's the Big Ten and I know everything is is tough to be certain on 
but I do think that they can do it against a Michigan State team that is, you know, again, they don't have a head coach right now. So we'll uh, we'll see from there. All right, rolling on. Let's get ready to get into our, our game MVP picks for K-State and Texas. If the Wildcats are to win this game in Austin, who's your offensive and defensive MVP in the game? Offense, it's got to be something about running the ball. I'll say Cooper BB because he has the toughest matchup of all going against Tavondre Sweat. Okay. Defensively, who 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 has to step up for K-State? I mean, it's going to be kind of a group effort there, but if one Uso. guy kind of shines through, who is it? I would say Uso. You got you to really control the middle line of scrimmage. This is a line of scrimmage game. Toughest team wins. Most physical team wins. Texas is a pretty – Physical can Kansas State rise the cage? I like who so. Yeah. All right. For me, offensively, I think that the key in this game. I mean, you're right. BB and the offensive line they kind of control the keys to this. On can they give enough room for one or both of the running backs or the quarterbacks to just get enough wiggle every time to get substantial yardage to where you're not getting backed up and having to throw it a lot. But in terms of how that plays out. Um, this this game comes down to Treshawn Ward or DJ Giddens and being able to put together the performances that each of them have the last three weeks. Now, they've kind of traded off on who's done it, but it's important for one of those guys to step up. And honestly, I, at the end of the day, I think based on how this game might go down and just the level that he's been at for most of Big 12 play, I would give the nod to DJ Giddens. So I think that this is a a big and important day for DJ Giddens and how he plays against Texas. Now on the defensive side of the ball, look, even BYU was able to force some turnovers last week against Texas. I think that's an important part of this equation for K-State. Um, they've, they've been able to, you know, maybe start to go in the right direction with that. They've got, I think four turnovers forced in their last three games. Now part of that uh, has a lot to do with the three that Texas tech gave away. But like I said, there were struggles last week, and Malik Murphy threw a pick. Uh, Texas fumbled the ball and lost it one time out of the hands of Malik Murphy. So I think it's important to have uh, to have turnovers forced, and I think a lot of that's going to start with the pressure that comes from the guys up front. We know Texas's offensive line is thought of pretty highly, but I think this is a Khalid Duke game where he has to kind of come and step up. I mean, it doesn't feel like we've talked about Khalid Duke that much recently. And I don't really care about the total sack numbers. Those are fine and dandy when you get them. But he just needs to be able to get in there and make a mess and get into Malik Murphy's face and be able to step up and make him have very little time, throw some bad balls, and give your DBs a chance to make plays because they are starting to look to do that. They have the capabilities to. So I'm going with Khalid Duke on defense because he's supposed to be your best pass rusher. So. That is uh, my pick for K-State's game MVP if they are to win. And they need to contain Xavier Worthy in the punt return game. He took one back against BYU. You can't allow a Texas to get a non-offensive touchdown. He has that capability. What I will say is Kansas State's only allowed two punt returns all year. Not punt returns for a score. Yeah. Like There's literally been only two punt returns. Okay, well, Jack Bloomer is on the list of uh, needing to be an MVP in the game for K-State, which honestly is probably true. I mean, he's going to have to punt more on Saturday, I would imagine, than he has in any game this year because uh, K-State has actually punted it very few times. Eh, maybe the maybe the Missouri game he would have probably punted a little bit more, but we'll see. I think that game will, will be pretty similar. OSU. Yeah. yeah, OSU, true. Yeah, he did get to do it a lot against OSU. I Look, I've tried to block that one out of my memory. That was just a, a not good night all around. Okay, when it comes to how this game plays out and then giving your winner and the score, uh, go ahead, let it fly, and, and tell everybody how it's going to be come Saturday afternoon at 2.30. Well, I think they got to make sure they don't let Texas get off to a fast start because I think that's part of been part of the problem. and. In the past contest, it just seems like Kansas State's always playing catch-up when they face Texas. So eliminate that from being from occurring because if, if so, then I don't feel great about it. It's a line of scrimmage game. Which team could run the ball better? You know, Kansas State stops to run pretty well. Texas, their running game is not as good as it looks on paper just because yeah. it's so predicated on the explosive play. 
for Kansas State, they're getting it done in a variety of ways in the running game, more, way, more ways to beat you. Chris Kleiman, throughout his coaching tenure, going back to his days in North Dakota State, every season has like a signature win where they're counted out, but they still pull it out. You haven't had that this year. <laughs> Typically at Kansas State, it's happened every year, but it's been Oklahoma that's been the victim yeah. of that Chris Kleiman trend. This year it's Texas. I think Kansas State finally gets – that signature win this year because they always get that signature win under Chris Kleiman, it feels like. So it has to come this weekend or there's really no other off- Yeah, yeah. If it doesn't come this weekend, you're not getting it at all. Yeah, so 23-20, K-State. Ooh, whoa, whoa, wow. Okay, well, uh, expectations are now high, and I'm just going to I'm just gonna give everybody a little dose of reality, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, with how how I'm, I think this game goes out. Look, I think K-State is going to be competitive. I think this is going to be a game that lives up to you know the, the billing that it's getting right now. I just think at the end of the day, I, the, the, it's just been two games for K-State that end up being disappointments this year. But they were disappointing enough in those games where K-State needed to step up and they just didn't. And... It's it's awesome what they've done. I think they are an improved team, and they they've been fine the last three weeks against you know some inferior competition. But as we've kind of seen, there is a a pretty significant drop off in the Big Twelve. There's a class that is here and a class that is here right now, and most of the teams in Class One are beating up on the teams in Class Two. And I tend to think that. Uh, K-State has done that. Now, are they ready for Texas based off what they did against Missouri and Oklahoma State? I just I, I can't believe it until I see it, and that's why I think that this is probably a game where K-State finds themselves in it at the end, but they're having to kind of play from behind. One of those games, honestly, maybe similar to last year. I don't think K-State gets down as bad as they did last year against Texas, but if you remember, like it was a close game last year K-State was just having to play from behind in the second half, and it came down to that final possession. I think K-State probably puts themselves in a spot where, you know, there's they, they've got the ball with like a minute left, and they need to go down the field and, and get a touchdown or something. And like we've talked about, we're just not confident in the passing game. That's K, K-State, I don't think they can win a game if Texas knows the pass is coming at any point. And – K-State has to be able to run the ball to score in any circumstance, and that's why I think Texas probably ends up uh, pulling out this game. So um, I'm going to take the Longhorns in this game. I'm going to go with Texas uh, by a score of 26, K-State 20. So there you go. That's my that's my prediction for the game. I know. I hate it, and I, I, I would like to, to go and say that I think K-State's winning this game, but – it just it doesn't seem like it's meant to be in all those years of of K State ownership over Texas. Uh, they've they've given Texas their 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 rights back. The Dobby's a free elf now in Austin, unfortunately. So I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that K State can can enslave Bevo once more, but I just don't know that it's going to happen. So I know I feel bad about it. You can keep shaking your head at me, and everybody listening to this is, but unfortunately, I, I have to. I have to be smart here, uh, and I, I don't want to be. I want to be stupid with my pick, but I'm trying to help myself out and everybody else out there with a little dose of reality. So, sorry. More thumbs down from D.Y. All right, well, uh, just because K-State might have a bad weekend in the Big 12 doesn't mean you have to watching the rest of it. Uh, K-State and Texas at 11 a.m. Now, if K-State loses that game in a tough way, there is a chance that you just turn off football and you don't watch sports again until – uh, until Monday night when K-State plays USC. And if K-State doesn't win that game, then you may not watch sports ever again. So we'll have to, to monitor everybody's uh, mental health situations throughout this weekend. But if you are going to watch the Big 12, Oklahoma at Oklahoma State, the final bedlam for a long time to come, kicks off at 2.30, a top 25 matchup between those two teams. I actually, I think the crazier and crazier I get, uh, the more I think that Oklahoma State is actually going to win this game. Um, I don't know why I should think that. I probably shouldn't, but I'm thinking it. And then two games that nobody cares about, Houston at Baylor at 2.30 on ESPN+. Plus. This is the third straight week that Baylor is playing a game on ESPN+. Plus, and I'm not even going to rule out that they don't play four straight when they come to Manhattan next weekend. And then the other 2.30 game, UCF-Cincinnati, 
I wrote about it in Big 12 Power Rankings this week. I'm hoping for like a surprise COVID breakout or like a bad weather that cancels the game because neither team deserves a win right now. KU Iowa State is a big fun one at six o'clock from Ames on ESPN and then BYU in West Virginia. So out of those games, DY, give give some thoughts on each of them and which one you're most looking forward to this weekend. I actually like Oklahoma and Bethlehem. If we know anything about Oklahoma this year is they don't get up for games that don't yeah. matter to them personally, but they have gotten up for the games that matter to them. And Oklahoma State matters to them. Um, and they notoriously have dominated that rivalry. Yeah. Houston Baylor that belongs on ESPN plus UCF Cincinnati that, that also should be on ESPN plus Kansas Iowa State I like Iowa State I like the fake teams that in the week prior they probably what stormed the field stormed the court yeah a big monumental moment for their program to the point where they kind of bask in that glory probably a little too long I could see that happening to the Jayhawks this week I like the Cyclones at home uh, even to cover the number, which is surprisingly only two and a half. BYU, West Virginia, not a lot of thoughts. I'll take West Virginia just because they're home. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure that the number on BYU, West Virginia was like West Virginia minus 12 and a half. I, I, don't, I don't know that I have a great feeling one way or the other to trust that, but uh, I will not be watching that game. I'll, I'll find other things to do. KU, Iowa State might be one of them. It's a it's an awesome weekend for the Big 12, and I really think that's just the biggest takeaway. And I started the show talking about it, but um, this this is the kind of the last hurrah for the the classic Big 12, and it's good that the the three schools or the three games involve six schools that are like those original Big 12 teams. They are everybody that has been in the Big 12 at any point recognizes them and sees them, and and will immediately think of that. Um, this is going to be a fun weekend, and it's meaningful because. Obviously, the the future Big 12 schools want to block out Texas and Oklahoma from Arlington, and uh, they have to put together a good showing, and they all have control of that scenario this weekend based on how they play. So we'll we'll have to watch and uh, see how, how they all go down. But Bedlam, historically, this feels like a game where Oklahoma probably just like steamrolls Oklahoma State, and it's like, yeah, there's a reason why Oklahoma State's only won this game like 15 times in the history of mankind. But – I don't know. I just uh, Oklahoma. I they think I think they proved to us last week that they are the frauds that we assumed they would be. They just were frauds that didn't have an injured quarterback when they played Texas earlier this year. Maybe you want a uh, fun stat. So the Big Ten West, um, which is apparently where you put all your bets this week. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> this could be of interest to you. Brian Ferentz is this is his final season. He has to step down after the year as the Iowa's offensive coordinator and he was not going to hit that uh, mark in his contract that he was supposed to hit which was what 25 points per game I believe which would have been 325 points total in the year I saw an interesting stat I think it was brought to my attention by Kellis Robinette but not only is Iowa not hitting that 25 points per game number this year there's not a single Big Ten West team that is going to score 25 points per game this year. Not one. <laughs> nice. So may, like maybe, that. maybe, maybe they gave him too high of expectations. The, the, if you're a Big Ten West school, that's just too tough of a number to hit. Yeah, it's a good point. A very good point. Not fair to Brian Ferentz. He's not he, 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 look. Yeah, you gotta hold him up. You gotta hold him up to the standards of everybody else around him against his peers. You can't just hold him to some arbitrary number that you want to throw out there. That, that even his peers can't hit. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm I am with you. I think I think you're right on Brian the money. Brian Ferentz got this. screwed. Brian Ferentz got screwed. Yeah, I've spread that message. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there uh, that that would <laughs> would side with you on that one. Okay, I'm doing a little uh, I'm doing a little bit of work here, uh, trying oh, to figure this out. In the history of the Oklahoma State Oklahoma series, Bedlam as we call it, uh, Oklahoma State has won. 19 games. Do you want to guess how many of those 19 games compared to the 91 that Oklahoma's won? There have also been seven ties. Uh, how many of those 19 games Oklahoma State has actually won in Stillwater? Four. It's a little higher than that, but it's not the majority. Uh, a majority of Oklahoma State's wins in the series have been outside of Stillwater, they have either been in Norman or in Oklahoma City. 
Oh, a little neutral side action. Yeah, they. I, I don't know the last time that they played in Oklahoma City. It's been a while, but that's something. Where do they play? A high a school? Lot. Is there a football stadium in <laughs> Oklahoma City? I have no. I have no idea where they uh, thought that they were playing those, but. They yeah. retrofitted the NBA court. Yeah, yeah. That, that I bring it back. Bring back playing in Oklahoma City. The last time the series was played in Oklahoma City was 1944. You said bring back playing in Oklahoma City. Bring back playing at all. This is the last one. Uh, true. Yeah. R- bring- R.I.P. Bedlam. Yep. And, hey, I, everybody's freaking out. <laughs> everybody's actually. freaking out three years from now about K State and Iowa State. Ending the the Armageddon series, uh, the Farmageddon. Not ending, series, it. So. Not ending it, just taking a year off. Oh yeah, uh, the last time that there was a year off in the Oklahoma Oklahoma State series, it was nineteen oh it was nineteen oh nine was the last year that a game was not played between the two teams. So uh, from nineteen ten to twenty twenty three, it was played uninterrupted. It's a lot of time. It's what I'm not going to do the math. 113 years because I said 1910 to 2023. So yeah, yeah, there you go. 113 years uh, gone down the drain. All right. Any other thoughts this weekend from around the Big 12 and and how the the log jam at the top might end up sorting itself out? I'll pick Kansas State, Oklahoma, Iowa State. Okay. Uh, of, so do you think of those three that you're picking to win? You that do you assume then that it's K State and Oklahoma that play in Arlington at the end of the year if they win this weekend? No, I'm not going to make that assumption because Oklahoma could lose again still. <laughs> uh, no so confidence into I have no confidence in them taking care of business when they're supposed to. All right, if K State wins this weekend though, are they in Arlington? Yes, but they could still lose another game and not be in dire shape too. True. That's true. Because I, I think going back to back with Iowa State KU is tricky right now. It is very tricky. It's not a fun way to to end the year. Uh and, and that being a road game in Lawrence makes it a little bit more of an interesting proposition. So we'll see how it goes down. But yeah, if you win this weekend, you may even be able to survive with two losses because you you can obviously give Iowa State a second loss if they continue to win. And Oklahoma State would have two of them, and then you're going to have to do tiebreaker math and all this other stuff that goes down into it because Texas doesn't play Oklahoma State, K State doesn't play Oklahoma. There's a lot that that would have to to fall around. So you're right, K State could have still an opportunity, but that yeah, just highlights yeah. even more why it's so big to beat Texas is because you give yourself a slight margin of error uh, if you win this game. If you lose to Texas, K State's chances are next to nil. I agree. Never won back-to-back league, conference championships, right? Uh, at, well, at least in the in the years that conference championships have meant something. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I can't speak for 1923 when they were playing in the Missouri Valley or the KCAC, but yes, uh, for the most part, Big Twelve, uh, yeah, Big Twelve, Big Eight, Big Six. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I don't think. Um, I mean, I, I could do some, some checking on that real quick and try and figure it out. Uh, let's see. Okay. The conference titles. All right. The, there have been seven in K-State history. They did win back to back 1909 and 1910. Uh, Same year that that run from the Bedlam started. Yes. Yes. Good point. Uh, 1909, 1910 K-State was members of the KCAC, uh, in, in those games, they got massive wins over Kansas Wesleyan, Southwestern, uh, the what at the time was Kansas State Normal, now known as Emporia State. Uh, they did beat Oklahoma State that year, so that's a big dub. They beat Wichita State 71 to nothing in 1909. By the wow. way, you mentioned Kansas Wesleyan. Shout out Kentucky Wesleyan, winning at the KFC Yum Center. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Right, good call out. I. I'm glad that uh, K State. Their their years of losing to Fort exhibition Hay games and all that. That's well behind them. But for K State wasn't even exhibition, right? That was a regular season game. Yeah. In the COVID year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So K State has not record. lost an exhibition game. It's not embarrassing because it wasn't an exhibition game. That's not it was true. An it, game. It's probably more embarrassing that you lost a regular game that counted. And, and, and Fort Hayes State's head coach was not there. 
Yes. Yeah. Even better point. Uh, <laughs> yes. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, coincidentally, 1910 is the last time that K State and KU did not play a game against each other. So just a, a little 1910 big year for the for the the Big Eight and these rivalries. They did. They didn't even know what was going to happen. But yeah. Uh, also, I just want everybody to know that uh, go. You can go to my Twitter at the Real Mason V. I am absolutely making a graphic uh, that memorializes K State's 71 to nothing win over. Uh, Wichita State in 1909 on way to a KCAC uh, title because, as we all know, I'm the world's biggest Wichita State hater. So, is that your uh, favorite year now, 1909? Yeah, I mean, it's up there. Uh, I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to do some digging on other years and see uh, other big outcomes against Wichita State, but that is certainly <laughs> one that I really enjoy uh, to, to look at. Uh, do you want to take a guess? K State, one of their two losses was the KU in 1909. You want to take a guess of what the final score was? And I'll give you a hint because it is crazy low. So just know that it's like a very, very low scoring game, but both teams scored points. Nine seven. Even lower than that. Six three. K State did have three. KU scored five points in the game. Five three, final score. Uh, there was an uh, Iowa game a couple years before I began to cover them in 2015. So actually this century, not in the 1900s, it was like 2012 maybe. I'd mm -hmm. have to go look. Uh, Iowa won six to four. Gross. Um, I am not lying. K-State gave up uh, a total of 11 points. In the 1909 season, okay, I was uh, wrong. Eight of which came to Missouri and KU. Uh, so I was wrong on the year. So it's still bad for this era of football. 2004, mm. Iowa beats Penn State six to four. That's when we. That's when Penn State should have kicked Joe Pa out when he scored <laughs> four points against Iowa. I don't even care. I don't even care how good or bad Iowa was during that time. You score four points, you're gone. Um, but hey, I, you know, safeties are impressive in my eyes, but all right, well, that will do it for us. We've got K state and Texas on tap. That is the wrong graphic. Give K state their property. The 23rd ranked team, in the country, according to the college football playoff, you get a big win. You probably shoot up even more. You put yourself back in the driver's seat to get to Arlington and try and defend the big 12 title winning in Austin makes this season look and feel a whole lot different right now. And then also moving forward, even with uh, the two losses that are, are mighty disappointing that are still lingering. So K-State and Texas, we'll see how it goes. All the coverage you need from the game over at kstateonline.com. So head to On3, find KSO, get signed up if you're not, be a part of everything we got going on there. That way you can get great pregame, in-game, post-game, info, breakdown, recruiting news, and everything else. And then we will be back here on Saturday after the game. We will have the instant reaction. I think Drew and I will take that on. And then uh, later Saturday night, early Sunday morning, the post-game show will be out, and we will recap everything full scale, with KSU underscore fan, on what happened between K-State and Texas as the Wildcats look to get their first win against Texas since I was a freshman in college, 2016. Charlie Strong, loser. So that is uh, what is riding on this game for K-State. Just trying to make me proud here. You know, the, don't let me keep saying, yep, K-State hasn't beat Texas since I was a freshman. I want to say K-State hasn't beaten Texas since I was a 25-year-old man. And I'm sure a lot of you are debating on if the word man suffices for me there. You might be right. So since I was 25 years old, we'll drop man off of it. So cats, horns, a lot of words just to say we're all looking forward to K-State in Austin this weekend.